reasons why we wanted to be here, and one of the reasons why we'll be coming back a number of times. And I appreciate very much uh, Brendan's work, uh, uh, not only on behalf of our campaign, but more importantly on behalf of the Libertarian Party. But what we're doing here in this campaign is very important in and of itself. I think we have a tremendous, indeed, a historic opportunity this election cycle uh, to make gains that the Libertarian Party has never enjoyed at the national level and at the local level. But above and beyond that, uh, we want to really build the Libertarian Party, build its roots and its strength, uh, so that every election cycle after this one, every two years, people put the Libertarian Party in the forefront of their mind, not in the back of it. Uh, because after all, what is the Libertarian philosophy? What is the Libertarian Party? It's the philosophy of our founding fathers. Uh, even though our founding fathers, uh, as you all probably know, uh, disdained political parties, uh, I forget exactly how they described them, but basically the main of, uh, of political life is political parties. Uh, you know, you can't keep you know you can't keep people vulnerable uh, without uh, an ability to organize and associate with like-minded people. And so, political parties developed very very shortly after uh, the first election uh, that we had, which elected George Washington. Uh, and uh, I think if our founding fathers were back here today uh, and they looked at the state of affairs and politics in America in this early part of the 21st century, first of all, they, uh, they'd be hard-pressed to recognize uh, what they have brought here uh, with uh, the, the tremendous growth of uh, government, uh, the tremendous uh, oppressiveness of government with regard to how it regulates, manipulates, and stifles free enterprise, free education, uh, in our uh, in our country, free expression. Uh, but I think they would look at the state of political affairs and be very proud of the Libertarian Party and feel a tremendous kinship uh, with the Libertarian Party. There is nothing more mainstream in America's political life, particularly right now in this early 21st century, than the Libertarian Party. It is America's party. It is America's political philosophy. And anybody that tries to describe it as an extreme or fringe party doesn't know it, and it is our job to explain it to them. We need to make sure that Americans understand that in the heart of every American beats the heart of a libertarian. Every American, by our very heritage, our nature, we're hardwired to be libertarian. That is to keep government out uh, and to maximize individual liberty. Uh, the only way we can maximize individual liberty is to minimize government power. Uh, and in the heart of every American, it feeds the heart of a libertarian. It might not be as strong or as obvious for those of us here this evening who count ourselves as libertarians with uh, a large L, capital L, but every American, if you talk to them, they're libertarian about something, uh, whether it's how to educate their children, uh, whether it's how to run their small business, and small businesses are the backbone not only of the economy here in New Hampshire, but across the country. 80% of the jobs in our country are small businesses, not major corporations. It might be what, uh, what those Americans do in their leisure time, in the privacy of their own home. They want to be free from government intrusion, and those activities the same as in the, in the process of educating their children, running their business, where they travel, how they travel, whether they can travel, how they spend their money, how they communicate. Uh, all of those things, every American, to one degree or another, believes in their gut, in their heart, that they should be free from government intrusion, government interference, but that's not where our country is nowadays. And if you look at the political parties in the sense that most people out there think of them as Republican and Democrat, uh, yes, there are policy differences between the two parties, but when push comes to shove on those fundamental issues of freedom, there might be that much difference between them. And a perfect example uh, is a piece of legislation that was just passed uh, a couple of weeks ago in the, in the Senate. Uh, the House passed it uh, uh, quite, a while, quite a while ago uh, and went to the president uh, who signed it. No surprise, he had let it be known uh, many, many months ago that he wanted to have legislation that would authorize the government to spy on its own citizens in their own country without ever going to a court for a court order. And both of the major party candidates at one time uh, said, well, the government shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, Senator Obama held out until the very end and then voted for the legislation. Uh, that legislation would amend something called the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, now uh, authorizes the government, unbeknownst to the citizenry, surreptitiously, 
It authorizes the government to listen in to any phone conversation that anybody makes, any email transmission that anybody sends or receives. The government henceforth now can, can electronically, surreptitiously surveil all of those communications so long as, and this is the, the only requirement that the government has to satisfy, the government bureaucrat has to reasonably believe that one party to the communication is outside the United States. Doesn't even have to be true as long as they reasonably believe. And I know that gets sort of esoteric and most Americans will not stay with you long enough to explain that, but if you talk to them about these issues in ways that they can't understand very quickly, such as do you want your government listening to your conversations for any reason at once without ever having to go to a court, uh, they inherently understand that. They might not know the ins and outs of the Fourth Amendment. They may have never heard of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. No reason why the average American should know about those sort of things. But they do have a gut reaction, a wrenching gut reaction to the government surreptitiously spying on them in their own country. That's just one example. But that's not the issue that's going to define the campaign in and of itself. Other issues are as well. Uh, and where we see the two parties uh, going in the same direction constantly with little, you know, little nuanced differences between them, uh, Americans have this sense about them that I think we can uh, take advantage of this election cycle that the system that we have is not serving them well. Many Americans feel that they go into the polling booth cycle after cycle and just sort of vote for the lesser of two evils, you know, the old uh, you know, sort of description of holding your nose and, and you know, voting for one of the R or the D just because, well, that's the way it's always been done, or you don't want to throw your vote away. Uh, the definition of throwing your vote away is to go into that polling booth and vote for one of two parties who will not change the direction in which this country is going, and that's the Republican or Democrat. There is a
There is absolutely no reason not to drill in those areas and do everything we can to start extracting that oil because our economy needs it. As Boone Pickens uh, said, a uh, fellow from Texas, uh, who I think testified uh, before the Congress uh, today, as a matter of fact, and he has put his money where his mouth is. I mean, this is the American entrepreneurial spirit. This is what we need to be focusing on and encouraging, not holding back, and that is free market, uh, market sources out there, people that have resources, people that have vision and are willing to put their money and their resources, their energy, to help move this country forward. Who picked this is doing that? Uh, I don't know exactly how many millions of dollars uh, he's putting into his educational ad campaign, uh, but he already uh, is, uh, is putting a great deal of his money also into uh, a future that he sees uh, uh, bearing fruit, and that is uh, wind power. But whatever it is, we need to be encouraging those, uh, those entrepreneurial steps, not allowing government to continue to stand in the way of those sorts of things, which it does more and more. And it really doesn't matter uh, to any significant degree, I don't think. I mean, I've been there in Congress. I've served eight years in, in the Congress as a Republican. I have seen the light, though. Uh, it's all known. Uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've seen what happens, how, how easily the folks that go to Washington uh, become uh, captured by the system. We had a, a group of uh, several dozen uh, new Republican members of Congress that were elected uh, along with myself uh, and uh, John Sununu at the time uh, in, the, in the class of 1994 uh, and uh, had a, uh, I think a very significant, a very positive vision and agenda laid out. Uh, and it worked fairly well for almost four years. Uh, we passed a uh, balanced budget amendment, passed welfare reform, which is uh, to me probably the most significant piece of legislation that the Congress has passed and the President has signed in the last generation. Uh, we reduced significantly the tax on capital gains, and you know, those were steps that were certainly in the right direction, not far enough, but certainly in the right direction. Well, then what happened? We had, uh, we had an election cycle in 1998, only just four years into that uh, so-called Republican Revolution, and what happened? Uh, it all fell apart. And I can tell you the exact minute uh, that I realized that it had fallen apart. Just a few days before the uh, 1998 off-year elections, uh, and Congress had not been able to pass a uh, spending bill, an omnibus spending bill, so all of these things were, so we would pass a temporary one and we wouldn't have enough votes, so they passed another temporary one. They had to get it done before, you know, breaking to send everybody home to do some last minute campaign. So the Republican leadership called us all into a room you know, behind closed doors. This is another part of the problem up in Washington. The Republicans meet behind closed doors. The Democrats meet behind closed doors. The Republican president talks with the Republicans behind closed doors. The Democrat president talks with the Democrat members or senators behind closed doors. They never talk with each other. So nothing gets done. Uh, as a libertarian president, that indeed would change and will change. But he called us all in just a few days before the election of 1998, and the leadership did and delivered one single message to him. And those of us uh, who came in in that great wave of 1994 and were firmly committed to downsizing the size of government uh, knew immediately uh, that we had lost. Uh, the message that was delivered by the Republican leadership to me as the Republican members of the majority was, as soon as this meeting ends, and this is the only purpose of this meeting, every one of you who is having a difficult time in your district getting reelected, I want you to sit down with the appropriators and tell them what you need in that omnibus spending bill that will help, that will help you get reelected. The revolution petered out right then and there, and it never recovered. The Republican majority was lost after that point, shortly after that, you resigned. And ever since then, uh, both parties have done what they do so very, very well, and that is turning up a lot of smoke, uh, a lot of rhetoric, uh, to give the appearance that there's really some stuff and some differences between the two parties. But when all of that dust settles, when all of that rhetoric that quiets down, neither of the Republicans are serious about limiting the power of the Democrats nor the Democrats and the Republicans, because both of the parties know that the way they have gained the system over the years through campaign finance reform, for example, means by and large that that pendulum will just swing, swing back and forth from R to B and B to R. So neither of the two parties wants to really limit uh, the power of the other parties because they know that they'll inherit that same reduced power at some point, and that is something they don't want. The only way that this system is going to change, the only way that we are going to get some real movement away from government power and back to individual liberty, back to what our founding fathers firmly believed this country could be, and that is great because government is small and the people are large.
hard is to vote libertarian, get a libertarian in as president, libertarians into the Congress and at the local government level, and things will change and they will start to change very dramatically and very quickly. That is a promise uh, that all of us know uh, is one that can will be carried out once we start getting those electoral victories.
digital resources, uh, physical, not physical, that's the next thing we need. Um, we need for you to volunteer, make sure that we know how to get in touch with you uh, so that we can get in touch with you and you with us. If there's a particular area that you'd like to work in, please uh, let, uh, let Brendan know that uh, and we will be uh, delighted and honored to take advantage of your offer to uh, lend your uh, physical uh, expertise and brain power uh, to this campaign here in New Hampshire especially. The other thing that we need, obviously, is, uh, is money. Uh, every individual uh, can contribute uh, $2,300 uh, their personal resources, not corporate. We do not take, cannot take corporate uh, donations. Obviously, maybe it's not obvious compared to some of the stuff Washington does. We can take uh, foreign money. Uh, only U.S. citizens or folks that are in this country uh, as permanent resident aliens can contribute locally to the campaign. We fought a lot of those battles uh, during when I was in the Congress with the prior administration. Uh, we take all of these restrictions very seriously. We might not like everything the FEC, the Federal Election Commission, requires of us, uh, but we do abide by the law. The law is very clear. We can take $2,300 in personal contribution uh, from every person uh, in, uh, who has, uh, has resources of their own. Children, as long as they have uh, income of their own, they can contribute as well as parents, grandparents, and great grandparents. Uh, one of the interesting things about how the FEC views election events is they say you can take $2,300 for a primary and $2,300 for the general election. They consider the primary season to be that period of time up to the time of the latest uh, selection of a party's nominee, which means in this year, not our uh, uh, selection process, which concluded uh, over the Memorial Day weekend, but the Labor Day weekend, which is when the Republican Party, which is the latest of the parties nominating events, selects formally its nominee. Uh, so we are still considered for federal election law purposes in a primary now. Uh, the good news for everybody here is that doubles the amount of money that you can donate to the campaign, $2,300 to $4,600. Uh, but whatever you all can give, uh, and for those of you who have visited our website, which I hope uh, by the end of this evening will be everybody that's uh, uh, has gone to the website, uh, similar to Ron Paul's, uh, although his, uh, his amounts uh, are higher, we hope to uh, certainly be up in that range as we move closer through uh, the uh, campaign. Uh, but contribute online, and every time you go to uh, the website, please contribute something. It doesn't have to be a lot. Uh, we contribute something so we keep that meter running so the, the public, when they go to the website, they see a number of different things. One is certainly the message of freedom and liberty and libertarianism uh, that is reflected in the substance of our website and the different uh, YouTube and other uh, uh, media events that uh, videos that are on there. But also that they can see, uh, like you, that, uh, that the support is out there, which we, uh, which we know it is uh, and which will be growing as we begin to focus more and more on the election uh, as we move uh, closer to uh, the end of the summer, uh, the beginning of the real fall campaign, the heart of the, uh, the campaign after the Labor Day, uh, Labor Day uh, campaign or uh, convention by the Republicans. Brendan, any other messages specifically uh, or housekeeping that we need to take care of before we uh, go to Q&A? Well, we need to pass out the uh, certificates People can make their donations on and so I can put their name and information on here. Please do. Yeah. 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 And in the back corner over here, we have all our literature of the Libertarian Party, uh, uh, our newsletters, if you want to pick one of them up, or if you want to pick up an application to join the party, if you haven't already done so, that's there. And I think that's really all we have. Okay. And, uh, and we're going to start asking these out. People, when they fill those out, uh, and you can donate, uh, put the information on there, if you use a credit card or, or a check, all the information is on there. Just get it to Brendan or Derek uh, this evening. Uh, we really do, really do appreciate that. I mean, I'm a working stiff like the rest of the folks in here. Uh, Gardner, what do you have to well, The other thing is, anybody who has to fill out a petition, please do so. Yes, uh, we, uh, uh, very, very good point. Ballot access is an important part of the libertarian effort. Uh, unlike the two major parties, in many of the states, uh, because of the level of the vote that libertarian candidates receive in election, uh, in the next cycle, we have to, to go through the process in many of the states to uh, gain ballot access by signatures. Uh, some states are much easier than others. Uh, the most difficult state of the union uh, to achieve ballot access for a third party or independent uh, candidate for, uh, for the presidency is 
ballot in 49 states plus the District of Columbia. Uh, and the only, as I say, the only problem there is, is Oklahoma, and we're going to have to rely on a uh, very good lawyer that's, uh, that's representing us out there and the, uh, the eloquence of our lawsuit and the arguments we will make. Uh, but this truly is a national effort. We intend to make this a competitive three-way race. Uh, with, uh, the key to that would be to get into the formal presidential debates. And that is a function of several things. Uh, the polling, uh, as we get closer to uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, campaigns, we don't yet know the exact dates of the campaign, but it will be in, in probably the mid uh, poll, uh, October sometime. Uh, they'll take uh, probably the same as they've done in the past, a weighted average of three or four different polls uh, in the days or a couple of weeks preceding the uh, first uh, debate. Uh, and if the, uh, the prior, prior years are, are, are going to be mirrored again this year, it will be in the nature of 15% polling nationally in order to uh, be considered a, what they consider a viable candidate. Now, there may be other criteria as well. But an important part of that, no matter where we're polling, and we believe that we will be polling sufficiently to be invited uh, to satisfy that criteria, uh, never underestimate the power of the two major parties to come up with some reason to keep us out of the debate. That's why it's so very important that uh, all of us, yeah. all Americans, uh, exactly, uh, all of us uh, need to let the media and the president, the Commission on Presidential Debates, know that we want an open debate. We want the American people to hear more than just the two sides of the same coin and realm, uh, which is the Republican and Democrats. And I think if they will do our part, we in our campaign will do our part uh, with regard to 